looking beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Let me you. pray over you, and then we'll let you dive in. Father, thank you for Amy, for the gift that she is to our family, to her passion for you. We thank you, God, for the anointing that rests on her. Pray, Father, for clarity of thought, clarity of word and vision in every way, in Jesus' name. And we command technology to work with her. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Landon. Can we give it up for Pastor Landon? It's so amazing. <laughs> I don't know about you, but have you ever been to a movie and you sit through all of the previews and then you forget what movie you're at? That's kind of how I feel. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm preaching. What was, yeah. So thanks for praying. <laughs> well, my, uh, my first obstacle that I overcame today was that I'm wearing shoes. <laughs> so I'm going to give you top five things not to say to a woman and, that's pregnant. And Pastor Landon has introduced many of them to me. <laughs> One of them being, do you miss your ankles? <laughs> so... They're back for a while, we'll see. I got my ankles back. I learned a new, new term from him, cankles. <laughs> Apparently it's where your calf and your ankle just collide. <laughs> so I'm learning a lot being pregnant. And so that's a couple of them. What was the other one? Oh yeah, this is a phrase not to use around a pregnant woman that I learned from Landon. <laughs> beep, 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 yeah. beep. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, it's good. I, I really... <laughs> you see, if, if, he wasn't, if he wasn't like that, then I wouldn't get you all to laugh. I mean, it works together. What else have I... Let's see here. Um, do you miss your ankles? We've, um, yeah, there's this other one. I haven't heard it as much, but my friend, she said people always say, you must be due any day now. And she's like, I have three months to go. <laughs> So don't assume anything, okay? <laughs> just like you said, you look beautiful and just stop. That's perfect. That's perfect. Um, the top two, it was hard to decide which one was the top one. So the, the, the second one, if we're going up from in degrees of rudeness, <laughs> the next one you really want to steer clear of is when she turns around, whoa. <laughs> Don't, don't go there, just keep it in, inside thoughts. And finally, my favorite is, are you sure it's not twins? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Anyways, it's really fun. I love being pregnant. I love, um, I'm so thankful for my husband. He's been so gracious and, and learning what it is to, to live with a pregnant woman. We were driving to Calgary to see his sister and we stopped for gas on the way and went over a bump and I was like, ugh. Oh, and he said, he said to me, are you sick? Are you tired? Are you hungry? Are you crying? <laughs> Covered all the bases. Uh, so I laughed. I laughed really good and then used the washroom at the gas station. <laughs> um, so thank you, honey, for being so gracious and understanding through this pregnancy. So anyways, today we're talking about saying yes as an act of worship. And so I have a video. Do you think it'll work, Elisa? So Tim Hawkins is a Christian com comedian, and we've just really enjoyed him lately. So this is Tim Hawkins on hand raising in worship. So if you've seen it, you know what you're getting into. If you haven't seen it yet, you have a lot to learn. So hit it. I know that each church has its own worship style, you know, which is cool. Some people are more expressive in worship, some people more subtle, and it's all good. Um, I go to a church that's pretty expressive in worship. It's, um, it's a hand-raising church. That's what it is, right? That's what, you know, anybody here go to a hand-raising church? Anybody here? Sweet. Who here does not go to a hand-raising church? <laughs> some of you are trying, you're like, I can't. I want to, Tim. I need to get some momentum. <laughs> totally cool. But hey, if you're not used to going to a hand-raising church, you want to go and join us, feel free to join us, but don't feel like you've got to join right in, okay? Start slow. we got a lot of different hand-raises that we use. 
We actually have names for our hand raises. So I'm gonna walk you through real quick, okay, what they are, just to let you know. Say you're at my church, music is rocking. Start slow, hands in the pockets, little elbow flap, you're fine. Very subtle, get warmed up, get your heart rate up. When you're warmed up, start with the first one. Ready, carry the TV. Carry the TV, that's our first one. Very subtle. Go to big screen, big screen, a little wider. Next one's my fish was this big, my fish was this big. If you're a liar, you can go out there, that's fine, don't worry about it. Jesus loves you, Grace. Next one's hold my baby, hold my baby. Got dueling light bulbs, that's our next one, dueling light bulbs. We got goal post, everybody knows goal post. Throwing a heartburn, a lot of people like to do heartburn. Double heartburn, right back to goal post. What's my favorite? Mufasa. Mufasa, that's my favorite. The circle of life. Tim, can you go higher? Yes, you can. You can take one hand, go a bunch of different stuff. Pointer, hatchet, schoolroom. Release the doves, give the Lord a high five. Press it out. A lot of women like to wash the window. Wash the window. And when you're comfortable there, go for the big three. Village people, Rocky, touchdown. There you go, there's your big three. You're set. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of worship training before we get started. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I just wanted to talk today about worship, and it's, uh, it's not all about raising your hands, but um, maybe God does want to take you higher, right up to the goalposts or whatever. But we're talking about today is yes as worship. So I don't know if the, do the slides work today or not. It's not a big deal. It'd be better to have the slide than my belly up there. So it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I made a slide thing for the first time, PowerPoint or whatever it is. So yes is worship. That's what we're talking about today. And if we could change our mindset about worship so that every time we say yes to God, it's out of a heart of worship. It's an act of worship. And the yes today, we've been talking about yes for the last month, Pastor Lannon and Paul. And did, did Josh preach yet on yes? No. So, <laughs> no, he hasn't. They've been saying some amazing things. I just loved last week listening to Paul about just take the pressure off. And, and just obeying God is the, is the win. You don't have to have some kind of an outcome from it. But I want to take a little bit of a different look at yes today as being a yes to a proposal. So Jesus is, he, he says um, in Hosea 2.16, he, he talks about, you no longer call me my master, but you call me my husband. And so the yes I want to talk about today is actually the proposal of God to you, and our yes can come out of a heart of worship, not out of a heart of uh, duty, or I, I need to say yes to God because he's putting this thing on my heart. A yes out of abandoned love for what he's done for us, and we're gonna look at a couple of stories from the Bible. So if you're going to say yes to a proposal, specifically for marriage, you have a committed, passionate love. So in our yes to Jesus, in this worship yes that we're answering him, it's because of a committed, passionate love. It's because we have absolute surrendered trust. If you're gonna marry someone, you have to absolutely trust them with your life to become one, to say, I surrender everything in my life to become one with you and a future of dreams and hope. And so if we can look at this yes now as everything I have for everything you have. We get, to, we get to marry the king of kings. Our yes is not just yes master, it's yes my husband, anything for you. I love you, I lay down my life for you. And in order to do that, we have to first see that he laid down his life for us. If all we ever see is how can I serve you, how can I serve you, how can I pray for that person or give this money or we're always focused on what are we saying yes to instead of who 
are we saying yes to? And that if he asks anything of us, it's not because he needs something. It's because he has something better for us. If we're giving him something, it's not like, oh, thanks, I needed that. It's like, now I can give you what I have for you. So we had, to, we had to say yes to his proposal, saying yes to a love that sets you free. He's not coming to put restrictions on you. He's not coming to, you know, if he's asking you to give up something, it's because he has something better for you, a love that empowers you. It protects and it provides. He's not, he's not asking you to put yourself out on a limb to be dangerous. It's because he has some dream for you. And so in our saying, yes, it's that love. It's that, what do you have for me next? So if we can engage with that um, in this next season of saying yes to God, not yes, master, but yes, what do you have for me? I'll give you anything, everything. Everything I have is yours anyways. And uh, we see that really beautifully in this picture in Luke 7. So if you want to turn there with me, I had it up on the screen, but it's like so many words. So you can just listen. I was reading this the other day. Maybe I need to have Kleenex. Just be ready with Kleenex (laughs) because it's so beautiful. Um, First of all, before I read it, there are, in each of the Gospels, there's a story of a woman who anoints Jesus and washes his feet and with her hair and everything and anoints him with uh, an alabaster jar. But from my research, I understand that there's two places. There's one that's six days before Passover at Simon the leper's house in Bethany. And that is a different scenario where Mary, Lazarus, there's, you know, Mary and Martha, it's back in that place. And Mary, the one who sat at Jesus' feet, is the one who anoints him. And Martha is serving the the food. And that's one scenario. Another scenario is at the home of Simon the Pharisee. You see, Jesus actually tried to reach the Pharisees. He had dinner with them. He wasn't totally separate from them. He was always trying to reach, like we think of Nicodemus, who came to Jesus, who was a Pharisee. So Simon is sort of like the Nicodemus Pharisee who's trying to figure Jesus out. He's in this posse of religious Pharisees who is trying to think, who, who is he really? Is he a prophet? Is he the Messiah? Like, I'm interested in what's going on with this guy, but I be, better be careful not to say anything to like disrupt my friends, but you can come. And so not as an honored guest, but Simon the Pharisee invites Jesus more so like we'll just kind of test him, him and his friends. So that's where we find ourselves in Luke 7, starting in verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair and she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. And when the Pharisee who had invited him in saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of a woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him a story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose it was the one whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, When I went to your home, you need to water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss. But from the time I first came in, she's not stopped kissing my feet. 
You neglected me the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, go, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Here's a Pharisee who's trying to believe in Jesus, trying to see, but he cannot see Christ for who he is because he's stuck in his own goodness, his own head, what he knows and what he believes. And here's this immoral woman that they identify as basically an adulteress, a a prostitute. Here's this religious man who doesn't even offer him the courtesy, offer Jesus the courtesy of water to wash his feet. They basically treated him like a slave. They didn't even honor him enough to let him wash his feet. And here the woman She hears that Jesus is in the house and she comes and she weeps because she knows he's the one to save her. She knows he's holy. She knows he is, he's the one who will forgive her. There's something in this woman that knows who Jesus is and there's something in this Pharisee that cannot see it because he's not acting or behaving the way he thinks he should. And so this woman who should never even come close to Jesus, anoints him, and and a woman is not supposed to let her hair down in public. That was, that itself, letting her hair down was dishonorable, but she took her hair, which it says is the glory of a woman, and she laid her glory at his feet. And this is the picture of worship, where she says, I am nothing, I have nothing, I am sinful, I deserve to die, but I need you. That's the kind of worship that Jesus responds to. And I felt a little bit like, how many times have I been like that Pharisee and walked into church and not even given him the courtesy to kneel at his feet? How many times have I held back because of what other people around me would think or my own situation in my head or that he's not responding to my situation the way I want him to? and I forget that he's already giving me everything I have. We think of that woman, the adulterous woman who was about to be stoned, and Jesus, Jesus says to all of the people around, all of the Pharisees and the, the religious men who are ready to stone her, and he says, he says to them, which of you with, without any sin cast the first stone? So not only does he forgive her, but he, he frees her from their judgment. And that's what Jesus wants to do for us. Our yes is, is, is the worship. He's looking for the worship. He's looking for the heart of the worshiper. So I just, I just love that story of her anointing, um, anointing Jesus' feet. And that's, what, that's the kind of worship that he longs for, is that abandoned everything I have when we realize that we wouldn't even be alive without him. And then it says, Jesus goes on to say, he has been forgiven little, loves little, but the truth is neither of those people could pay their debt. So, so if you identify with that person who's like, well, I haven't done all these horrible things, the truth is you can't pay your debt. So whether we're all the same, whether, whether it's an immoral woman or a, a murderer or a tax collector or a Pharisee, we're all the same. We can't pay the debt. And Jesus paid it. It's a, it's a matter of if we can see our need. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who know they need him, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Amen? So I just want to take a moment and pray. God, in order for us to pour that kind of love out, we need to see you for who you are. So Lord, as we continue to read in your word, as we continue to just be in your presence, reveal to us who you are. As we sang this morning, the Lamb of God.
who takes away the sin, who breaks the chains. The Lion of Judah, who can stop him? Jesus, reveal to us who you are so that we can respond to you like this woman who knew that you were the Messiah. You were her only hope of survival, her only hope of forgiveness. Lord, let us see that you've laid down your life so that we could have it, so that we may lay down our lives for you, God, that no cost is too much. And Lord, speak to us about the things that you have for us. Speak to us about the love that you have for us and the blessings and the honor that you want to bestow on us and, and what we can have through, through being united with you. Lord, that our yes is to, is to what you have to offer us, not just what we have to offer you. God, today may we receive some of that inheritance so that we can say, wow, I owe you my life. It's all yours. God, do this by your spirit, I pray. In myself and every heart here, Lord, whether we have been saved for 50 years or we haven't made a decision yet to say yes, move that on our hearts today that you gave up everything so that we could have it. We just need to say yes. Jesus, Holy Spirit. Lord, speak to each heart words that I don't know and I can't speak. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. The next thing that, um, that God showed me was Abraham. And we, had, we were saying yes to God in Sunday school a couple weeks ago. What does it take to say yes to God when he asks something difficult of us? And I can't think of anything more difficult than Abraham and Isaac, the story. <laughs> and it was just killing me. I was sitting here with Bennett this morning on my lap. He's not even my son. He's my nephew. And I'm thinking about how much I love him, the way he talks and his skin and his eyes, and I love who he is. And I thought of how Abraham loved Isaac, finally the son he'd been waiting for, the promise from God. And then God one day says, go up and offer him a sacrifice of worship to me. What? That doesn't make any sense. But if you look at the, the passage in Genesis 22, it's really neat. Abraham's faith in God's love and God's promise is stronger than the sacrifice that is being asked of him. Genesis 22, if you want to take a look at it or mark it in your Bible. This, this sacrifice of worship, I, yeah, like I said, I can't think of anything bigger than God could ask. You know, God might ask to sell your house or to give away your car or, or those kind of things. He might even ask you to give up your life, you know? But to give up your son or your daughter? Mm-mm. Being, being pregnant and, and learning that this baby is gonna be mine and I get to steward it for the rest of, we get to steward it for the rest of our lives. To, to think of God asking me to sacrifice, I just, nope, that is one thing, nope. But something that we forget is that, first of all, God never actually intended for him to do that. It was a test, and it says that right in Genesis 22. God wanted to test Abraham. So take it out of your mind that God ever wants anyone to sacrifice their kid. He doesn't, it was a test. And now we know that test. <laughs> And secondly, he, he never went through with it, and he's never asked anyone to do it again. So we just have to understand here that God is testing Abraham to see if he can handle the promise. God is testing Abraham, and I have to quote Hunter. We're talking about this, Hunter Steer. We talked about this in Sunday school. Seriously, plastic cups being broken everywhere, Fruit Loops flying, four-year-olds to 12-year-olds, Okay, why do you think God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son? That doesn't make sense. And Hunter just puts up his hand. We finally listen to Hunter. He says, God just wanted to know if Abraham loved him more than anything. I, was, I just started to cry in the midst of all of this. God just wanted to know if Abraham loved him more than anything. More than his son. More than the promise. 
It doesn't make sense, but if we put God first, if we give him our life, if we say it's all yours, he's not looking to take it away. He's looking to give us more. He's looking to see if he can trust us, if we really love him, if we'll really obey him overall, no matter what, no matter the cost. Let me repeat, he is not looking to take something away, he's looking to give. So whatever he asks of you, it's worth it because he has something for you in it. Always, always. Genesis 22, the faith of Abraham, he says to the servants as they're, um, they'd packed up the boys carrying the, the wood as a picture of Jesus carrying the cross. And, and they're going up the mountain Moriah and Abraham says, the boy and I will travel a little farther, we will worship there, and then we will come right back. And then in, if you read in Hebrews 11, it says that Abraham knew and trusted God that if he was going to offer up his son that he would raise him back to life. It's, it's in Hebrews 11 if, if you wanna look it up. He just knew this is God's promise, he's gonna figure it out. He's not taking anything away from me. Then, Genesis 22, verse 15. The angel of the Lord called again to Abraham. So this is after Abraham puts him on the altar. Like, Abraham means business. He's going to obey, and God stops him. Whoa, stop. Okay, I believe you. And verse 15, the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. You have not withheld anything from me, so I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. He walked with that promise for a long time. He, when, when God asked Abraham to go to a land, I will show you. Many of you might be in that place right now where God's saying, go, and you're like, where? He's just, go. <laughs> what? Go to the land. I'll show you. Do you trust me? That marriage commitment. We'll walk together. Do you trust me? Can you leave, up, leave your old life to have my life? And the thing that takes away the fear is the love. Whoa, where are we going? This is going to be awesome. That's what Abraham was like. Sure, where are we going? His, and that was because of his intimacy. He knew God. And he looked crazy. He looked crazy. Seriously, offer your son? What? What? It's one thing to, to, to go to a foreign land. That's one thing. But he looked crazy for God. The, the sacrifice of love because of his intimacy, because of his trust, because he knew God would raise Isaac from the dead. Whatever you say, God, because you're God. I love Ava uh, Carruthers, five years old. I was teaching her kindergarten. And she said, man, I'm glad I'm not God. I mean, come on, I think we need to adopt the theology of a five-year-old. Man, I'm glad I'm not God. Whatever you say, God, I, I'll obey you, I trust you, I love you. you. Like, everything I have is from you. So Abraham's in this place of he's obeyed God and followed him to the ends of the earth. He's not about to stop now. So because you've obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you, multiply. And then verse 18, and though, sorry, and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you've obeyed me. If we're willing to obey, if we're willing to say yes, because we love him, because we trust him, because we know that he has blessing in it for us. It's no longer, like there's no longer a decision. Abraham didn't wait, he went the next morning. Like there's no longer a decision when he asks us. And today we get to decide, am I gonna say yes no matter what? Am I gonna trust? And it's sort of like a, 
a marriage ceremony. We are invited today to move from the master relationship with God, the servant relationship with God, to the union of yes, of no matter what God, you have all that I am because I have nothing without you. Just as I finish up, I wanna invite up Katie, and I don't know who's playing for you, but we're just gonna sing the song, You Are Worthy of It All. And we were singing this with the kids. The words are, for from you are all things, and to you are all things. There's nothing I have that doesn't already belong to him. I live in a beautiful house with my husband. So much of what I have is from him because I said yes, because I love him and I trust him. For him, for him to ask me something, I mean, everything I have is his already, right? So for me to hold something back from him doesn't make any sense at all. He, everything he has is for me. And that's what our relationship with God is. Everything he has is ours. So whatever we have, just right back to him because he is so much more for us. And today, there might be something that you're holding on to that God says, if you let go of that, I can bless you. God wants to set some of us in here free today. He wants to set you free from fear of losing that thing you're holding on to, if you can give it to him and trust him with it. Romans 12:1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Not, okay, everybody, offer yourselves to God now in view of God's mercy. He only wants to give. He only wants to clothe you with righteousness. He only wants to make you new. He only wants to give you life. He only wants to bless you in view of his mercy because he died. You see, he said yes to the Father. It wasn't just the Father sending the Son. Jesus said yes for you. In view of God's mercy. The other other scripture that was running through my head this morning was whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And so our whole life can, this act of worship, this yes to God, this how can I show you how thankful I am? How can I love you today? It's not just what he asks of you, but acts of worship out of your own heart to him. Offerings. He's not asking me to give money. I want to give it. He's not asking me to go serve at the church. I want it. Whatever it is, he's not asking me to do something. But it's in my heart. I want to show him how much I love him. This woman who offered the, the, um, the anointing oil, he didn't ask her to do that. It was her act of worship. It was her saying, I believe in you. I want your healing. I want your freedom. I want your forgiveness. I want to be identified with you. That's what our worship is. And every day can be an act of worship. Everything we do. So I just want to invite you to um, reflect right now. What has God been putting on your heart already over this month if you've been following with us? Something he's been putting on your heart to say yes to. Maybe, maybe it's repenting to someone and making a relationship right. Maybe that's your yes. And so as an act of worship, you go to that person. You're saying, God, I love you so much that I'm going to humble myself and go to this person and repent. Or I'm going to let go and I'm going to finally forgive this person as an act of worship to you, God. Everything I do is an act of worship so I can receive what you have for me. Maybe it's giving something up, an addiction or a sin or a, it doesn't even have to be that. It, it, whatever he's asking of you, maybe it's time, that yes to say, to spending time with him. Not as a duty, but as a, I love you so much. My whole time is yours. Of course, I would give you this time. 
this money, this, my, my family, everything, nothing comes before you, God. Because without you, I wouldn't be here. Maybe it's extravagant worship. Maybe you haven't let yourself go in worship, whether it's at home or at church or in your car. Maybe you just haven't taken that step in worship where you really just lay it all out before God and love on him, totally free of whoever's around you, whoever's looking. And you just, maybe you want to dance. You've been, you're looking at those people and going, I know I'm supposed to, but I don't know how. That's okay, neither do we, right? Well, actually, Ariel knows what she's doing, but whatever it is that you want to say yes to. So I'm just going to invite you to pray with me and just allow God to search your heart and speak to you as we sing this last song. Jesus, I think of that song we sang earlier. Call, I want you to call me deeper, deeper into your love. I want more of you, God. What I have is not enough. I know there's more of you, and so my yes needs to become every day, every second, every moment that you are worthy. So God, right now, just speak to us through your spirit. Pour out your love. Show us who you are. Draw us close to you, God. And just feel free over the next, we have about five minutes, feel free to just respond to him if you want to worship. Come to the front, lay something at the altar, stand, kneel, whatever you want. Let's just take the next few moments and respond to him.